overeducated, underskilled. Maybe it's the other way around, I forget. And I'm obsolete. I'm not economically viable. Welcome to the podcast of Post Postmodern Madness and Societal Decay. Not economically viable. With your entropy coordinator and spirit guide Jay Swift. viewers and listeners to another installment of Not Economically Viable, the vodcast of post-postmodern madness and societal decay. Today we're going to turn our attention toward one of the most pressing constitutional questions of our age. Just how far does the First Amendment go to protect the most unpopular and offensive of expression? Joining us for the debate is Mike Coughlin of HalfGuard.com, a lawyer by trade who has experienced firsthand the stifling of nonconformist, politically incorrect speech while recently attending a program at Yale University. We'll make our way through about a dozen or so Supreme Court cases on the matter of free expression before mulling the ultimate First Amendment question of this day and age. Is there anything truly preventing extreme, European-style hate speech laws from becoming the norm in America? Yeah, you really don't need me to hop this one up, do you? With that in mind, how about we hop straight into the thick of the discussion, eh? Alright, Jay Swift here with another edition of Not Economically Viable, the podcast of post postmodern madness and societal decay. And uh, for this edition of the program, we're going to be discussing the war on free speech. And we have a guy who knows quite a bit about the legalities of this particular issue. Uh, not only is he a lawyer by trade, he's also a guy who has experienced firsthand a little bit of that First Amendment oppression at an Ivy League school. Welcome, everyone, to the program, Mr. Mike Coughlin. Hello, James. I, yes, I am a martyr for the cause of freedom, but we all need to water the tree of liberty with our blood sometimes. Yeah, and of course this is going out to a pretty wide audience. It's being shown on several different platforms, so there may be some people who are reading this or listening to it who have never heard of you or been to halfguarded.com. Do you mind just giving us a quick introduction about who you are and some of the things you do? Yeah, my name is Mike Coughlin. I run the website halfguarded.com. It is an eclectic group of individuals, to put it lightly. We cover everything from mostly professional fighting, but we delve into the most esoteric of topics from here and there. I'm uh, in my mid-30s. I've been a practicing attorney for, oh, I don't even know, seven, eight years now, something like that. Uh, prior to that, I've worked in uh, state government here and there, and uh, I just completed a, I like to brag and call it a residency, but it's just a three-week uh, course of study in uh, writing at yeah, Yale University. Fantastic, fantastic material right there. And we're definitely going to need your legal know-how to get through this episode. Because there's a lot of, you know, really complex constitutional law that to the laity may be a little hard to understand. So all that uh, education at law school may actually come in handy for once. Yeah, you know, between this and telling people, yeah, no, you just, you're going to get arrested. It doesn't matter. You're screwed. The system is against you. That's what I do for the most part. You know what? And that's why you are considered a humanitarian in my books. <sighs> you know, you you said that. The Pope said that the other week. It's a, it's a pretty wide group of people who are finally understanding I'm a man of the people. I, I'm really, like I said, a martyr for the First Amendment. And that is a perfect segue into uh, the introduction to this particular issue. Uh, very quickly, I've been collecting articles about, say, hate speech ordinances and laws and crimes of that nature going on in Europe. I'm just going to very, very quickly run down a few headlines here. I'm going to kind of see what your opinion on it is. Uh, first up, we've got, in Germany, 36 accused of hateful postings over social media. Uh, we have one from the UK, uh, from the Metro. Man and woman arrested after burning Koran in racist YouTube video. Uh, from the Independent in the UK, arrest for offensive Facebook and Twitter posts soar in London. And just to show this isn't necessarily just a continental Europe thing, a couple of things from Canada. Uh, looks like we have a story about a Kirkland man detained by officials for posting hate speech on social media. Uh, and we have yet another one about an American speaker arrested in Canada for smuggling, quote-unquote, hate speech on his iPad. 
<laughs> I like that people are now like uh, smuggling books into Canada the way we used to smuggle whiskey into America. Yeah, and here's the thing. We kind of expect this out of Europe, and we even kind of expect it out of Canada a little bit. I didn't even really get to the best one yet, and that's a story about the German guy who was arrested because his pug, and I know you're definitely a puggle guy, gave a Hitler salute in a video, and he was arrested for an action his dog did in a video. That's not, is that the same, that's a different guy than the guy in Scotland who trained his girlfriend's dog? No, to... but, yeah, no, believe it or not, there are actually two European <laughs> cases of people being arrested for their dogs giving Hill Hitler salutes. In both cases, it's a pug that did the, the, the Heil Hitler. I think what the real story here is there's something going on with European pugs. I think we should investigate that angle a little bit more here. But in the meantime, we'll just laugh as Germany makes sure to show the world that they will never tolerate the intolerant by, you know, being intolerant. They really got it all figured out there. Same, same verse, second verse, same as the first. So I think it, it's pretty safe to say that at this point, Europe, and I think Canada is definitely held on this trajectory, I mean, there's no hyperbole, no exaggeration. They're literally an Orwellian thought control state. Oh, yeah. Um, it's and it's out of control. Like, I've seen it more and more here in the United States, sadly, as well. But uh, I, I talked to my buddy Tony about this today. We're thinking about keeping track of a list of words that are literally being used in the exact opposite manner. And the big one seems to be uh, freedom and free speech. It, it's... It's astonishing. People just think that they can say something and we'll just assume that we're not stupid, but it's kind of, it's getting really terrifying out there. I mean, and it's happening. I think people really need to look at the colleges because that's the future. That's where all the, that's where the future leaders are bred and born and all this stuff. And they seem to have marched exponentially forward into, they, they don't even care about freedom of speech anymore. They, they're out and out fascists and it's and they don't even know they they think it's a good thing to be that way. I guess all fascists inevitably do end up thinking they're doing the right thing. Yeah, and I mean the general overview we're trying to get at here is obviously things have gotten that bad in Europe. So what safeguards do we have in the U.S. legally to prevent that from happening? We'll get into some civic Supreme Court decisions later on to kind of see where we stand legally. <coughs> I think now is a really good time to kind of retrudge over your experience at Yale and how you were accused of being a white supremacist. So, you mind uh, giving us a little uh, backstory on what happened there? Yeah, um, what happened is uh, I went to Yale for writing. Uh, I was focusing on nonfiction, uh, writing memoirs. And, uh, you know, it was a multiple week program, like I mentioned earlier. I went in there with as open mind as you could possibly get. I knew that. I was going to be the odd man out politically, but I thought, you know, I'm just going to be open and honest. I think it's good, uh, always respectful. Like, let people see, you know, just because you're, you, you know, even if you're a millimeter to the right of, of Stalin, as I like to say, doesn't mean you're a fascist. Like, you can be an, you can be a real human being. And, uh, but I, you know, I think for the most part, I got along with everybody. And then I think the second or third to last day, I uh, my prof my main professor talked to me. And he said that he got an email from somebody who I never knew who it was, and obviously couldn't have known me, asking about the quote unquote white supremacist in his class. And that was me, which it was really stunning to be called a white supremacist for real. Like, not on the internet. Like, this is like in the real world at, at Yale. Like, come on. And the evidence was that on Facebook, I had clicked like. On the Proud Boys group, because on halfguarded.com last year, I interviewed Gavin McGinnis, who started the Proud Boys and also founded Vice Magazine, been, you know, big time guy for a long time. And I clicked like on the group. As I always point out, I have 905 likes on Facebook, so I like a lot of stuff just to see what's out there. And so that, along with the fact that I had listed as a joke job title, that I was the chairman of the nonpartisan anti Chinese League. Which is a I don't I don't know if it was obscure, but it's a reference to the movie Tombstone, where the squirrely town wannabe had that listed as one of his job titles, and I always found it hilarious. And in fact, if you Google it, that's the only thing in the world that comes up for that group because there is no nonpartisan anti-Chinese league in the United States of America anymore, as far as I'm aware. And so that was enough for somebody to in private. It's always in private. Nobody will confront you like this, it seems. But they. 
call me a white supremacist, not a right winger, not a conservative, not a libertarian. I could I could understand something. Like, what about that Trump supporter? I would be like, that's not quite accurate, but fine. You're lumping us all in the, together on the right. No, a, a white supremacist, and it was just it was astonishing to think that that's all it takes to be labeled a white supremacist. I, I don't know. I don't know what they would do if they ever actually met an actual white supremacist. I, I they probably just have their head explode at this point. So, did you ever uncover the identity of this person? Was it a fellow student in the program, or is there just someone actually in there at Yale who's got a? I'm guessing maybe like an internship where they just monitor social media, trying to find any signs of white oppression and the patriarchy online. Um, I don't know who it was. I never asked. I didn't see any point to it. I didn't think that my professor would tell me anyways, which I understand. It was said in confidence. Um, I suspect that it was a teacher, one of the other teachers in the program. That's what my guess would be because I, I don't think that the other students would know who I am if they weren't in my class. And I didn't never, I know I never had any kind of clash with any uh, students. There was one professor that I had mentioned to, cause they always ask, who's your audience? Who's your audience? And I, you know, the, the real answer for me is whoever would pay me. I don't care. But I was, but after a while I came up, my stock answer was, and I said it to this one professor after the night of drinking, although I'd sobered up somehow. And my stock answer was always the same, which was, I want to write for everybody that voted for President Obama and for President Trump. That there's this great ground of people out there in the United States that are in this middle area where every couple of years they're looking for somebody to give them something new. And so I said, that's my audience. And, uh, and then she made some remark about, because I said something like, you know, that just, you know, like the, uh, the forgotten white people of America or something like that. And her response was, you know, white people have run everything, white men have run everything for so long. I don't think they could take a break. And I just kind of, again, I shrugged it off. That's the only person I can think of that had any encounter with me that was mildly political. And I don't know, they must have looked it up and I'm sure they were looking for something. And they found enough in their Peabody brain to, uh, in, you know, in doctor, uh, condemn me. You know, th there are so many logical fallacies I just want to get into there. <laughs> you know, the whole idea of, first off, the, the teacher saying that any racial group, any sort of, you know, gendered people have had too much time running big business or government or whatever, that in and of itself makes me wonder <laughs> why is that person in academia? Well, like, aren't you promoting a, a hateful agenda? <laughs> It's a writer, you know, it's, 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 you know, sensitive artistic types. And, and what's really sad is that I went in there and I'm very proud of myself that I was exposed to a lot of a lot of feminist writers to program. This seemed to be a lot of stuff we read. And I was like, OK, I know there's going to be a political edge here, but I repeatedly told everybody I love this. I'm really grateful to be reading this. I may disagree with some of the things or their conclusions, but I think the writing is great. And I, I like the perspective from like a you know, a human perspective, uh, point of view. And uh, meanwhile, apparently, uh, I guess, I mean, basically this person told me my point of view, my writing would not matter. What I have to say would never matter, which, you know, in hindsight now, what a really insane thing to say to a student. Yeah, somebody's uh, paying your salary, aren't they? Yeah, the money I dropped on that program is paying part of her salary there, but you know what? I was in the end. I'm kind of glad that it happened because there's nothing like being 100% confirmed correct in some of your assumptions in life. You know, one of the things that I definitely want to write about and talk about at some point in the future is that you know I spent half of my professional career working on college campuses, either working directly with the university in marketing or working as a reporter under some sort of you know program they have there. And I had the uh, joy of being a college employee at a traditionally female liberal arts college during nice. last year's election. <laughs> so you can only imagine. You have to wait you know, a couple of years before you can actually talk about what you had at a former employer. But, you know, just looking at what I saw on campus, you know, there and especially seeing in the Ivy League schools, this phenomenon of students being adamantly terrified opposed and sometimes violently in opposition to free expression 
when did this start? Because this is a relatively new phenomenon. You know, I graduated from college in 2012. This wasn't happening. So there's something that happened culturally between then and, you know, 2014, 2015 that kickstarted this. And I can't put my finger on exactly what changed in American culture. So do you have any guesses on what changed socially? I, it's one of the, to me, it's one of the great mysteries. Whoever cracks it will, uh, have a really successful book, at least within the political science sphere, because yeah, when I, I you know I graduated undergrad in two thousand five, and it, I mean yeah, I, I always knew that being the conservative guy on campus, I was a little bit of an oddity. I was uh, a different human being back then. I was a very straight laced kind of dork. Uh, I remember being in one. I remember being in a political science class in my freshman year. This political science class, and I found out like one of the nicknames kids gave me was the president because I knew all this stuff. This is, again, a political science class. but So I, I was challenged by the professors. I knew that they would call me a lot. and it, Maybe it hurt me a little bit here and there, but for the most part, everybody was cordial. You know, the teachers may come at me, but nobody insulted me. Nobody threatened me. They just, you know, they challenged me. Which I always thought was great. This just makes me smarter. Uh, you know, iron sh sharpens iron and all that. So I, I'm really curious as to what brought it about. All I can think is <clears throat> maybe... But the passage, it sounds really weird, but the passage of Obamacare, because it was it coupled with the explosion in gay rights, I wonder if these, those two things came together to create within really, you know, the, I don't know, grade school or high school kids who were just kind of becoming woke, if you will, that those two things with the internet being so prevalent now. That you and I grew up in a time before the internet, and even with the internet, we you know we're a little, we're on the sadly we're on the older side these days. So we were used to we've had the experiences of being challenged and talking to you know talking to people face to face that disagree with you, and this could be a result of the you know the widespread use of social media where people become more and more insulated, and especially I think on the left because again. I, from my perspective, they're more emotional in their decisions, and so they're going to be more prone to their feelings. And without, you know, without they don't have the they, they're not old enough to have a brain that's developed well enough to be rational. And the social media, I think, is just retarding that progress. Yeah, that's definitely something to chew on, and we'll get back to a very important word called intersectionality towards the end of the video. Jeez. Which I think may be sort of the, the X factor to all this. All right, and before we get into some of the constitutional cases, which are really relevant in seeing just how far the anti-free speech movement can go in the U.S., you know, I'm one of those guys where I like to say I'm, I'm pretty cynical. You know, I'm even kind of quasi nihilistic. But one of the very few things I believe in, and I think has merit, is the idea of free expression that all people inherently have the right to believe whatever they want, say whatever they feel, and not really be punished for it. Certainly not by the government or the majority or whoever's in charge. But what I've noticed is speaking with a lot of millennials and some Gen Z kids, that idea is not instilled in them. You know, that's like completely sort of a verboten idea. And I can't fathom, you know, where exactly did we lose the passion for free expression in this country? I, all I can think is we got to a point of uh, you know pretty decent equality and not, not perfectly egalitarian, but pretty close. And so people who have been raised to think that there's something going on that you're being discriminated against, well, when they can't, nobody's getting hit in the streets, nobody's getting denied to go to school, nobody's getting denied marriage, nobody's being discriminated against in the workplace – they're trying to, you know, it's a form of cognitive dissonance. They're trying to, you know, bring it all together and, re and you know, make the two things make sense. So all they can think is, well, now it has to be your speech, your idea, your thoughts. You know, if you're using the wrong pronoun, for Pete's sake, you've committed a hate crime and it's violent. And so they're now, they've never had to worry about freedom of speech. So instead they just want to focus on I don't know, some wacky uh, world where the most important right of them all doesn't matter at all. 
And one of the things that, you know, I think even adults who went to college are sometimes sort of asleep on is the fact that, you know, the Constitution does not necessarily guarantee you freedom of anything. And I think especially with the First Amendment, I don't think anyone out there is a total and complete First Amendment absolutist. I mean, you know, if someone goes out and steals your credit card information and posts your pen on Facebook, then, yeah, I mean, you want someone to be punished for that. But just looking at the idea of free expression being political ideas, social ideas, just basically your feelings about things, when you look at just the nature of constitutional law where it is now, there's a couple of things that I think work as safeguards, but by that same token can also be used as weapons against free expression. So I need you to break out your best uh, constitutional law hat here and kind of guide us through a couple of very, very important First Amendment cases and just kind of give us, you know, the, the basic uh, plebeian you know, definition of these complex legal terms and outcomes. And the first one, and I think this is probably the most relevant when it comes to anyone who wants to draft hate speech laws in America, if it comes down to that, is a term called the Fighting Words Doctrine. For this one, you got to go back to a Supreme Court case from 1942 called Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire. And uh, just you know, from your cursory knowledge and what you learned in law school, what can you tell us about fighting words as constitutionally prohibited speech? Um, I, I don't even know if it's really prohibited anymore, but there was an idea... It's a certain time in the country where words that would naturally engender a, a physical response, if you will, were not considered protected speech. It, it's, I, it's very funny, but it's very much exactly like today. But back then it was simply your honor would be insulted. So if someone said that your wife had been married once before, well, no reasonable man would respond with anything but a punch to the face in those in that sense, in that uh, situation, and therefore it's not really uh, free speech because anybody saying th that word would know that they will absolutely, without, without any doubt, get punched in return, and so therefore they're just trying to create violence. Uh, pretty much almost every decision since, from what I can kind of remember, is essentially nullified all of that. I'm just going to read a very quick uh, two-sentence cold from that uh, decision from 1942. And this is the part where I think if there's any sort of pre-existing law or any sort of you know, constitutional precedent for perhaps bringing this European, Canadian-style, uh, you know, anti-free speech jihad to U.S. shore, I think it'd probably be these two words, which to this day still haven't actually technically been overturned by any subsequent cases. Uh, to quote, these include the lewd and obscene, the profane, the libelous, and the insulting or fighting words, those that by their very utterance inflict injury or tend to incite an immediate breach of the peace. It has been well observed that such utterances are no essential part of any exposition of ideas and are of such slight social value as a step to truth that any benefit that may be derived from them is clearly outweighed by the social interest in order and morality. So uh, I guess, why is the Supreme Court trying to, you know, define and judge morality of all things? Um, that's, I mean, that's just the nature of the courts are always, on some level, that's what it means to be in the Supreme Court, is you're trying to interpret the laws, which in theory, the law should reflect the public, I mean, you could say the public morals of the, major, of the, of the people when they passed said law. So in that sense, they're trying to discern what the intention was behind the law and what the, you know, again, what the norms would have been. Uh, and so it's be fair for them to say, look, when the First Amendment was drafted, nobody at that time would have ever thought for a second that it protected insulting someone's honor. I mean, these are people that, there's probably a lot of credibility to that. I mean, think about the fact that, uh, you know, Burr and Hamilton, you know, the vice president murdered the secretary of state because of an insult. You know, there's no danger that the founding fathers literally murdered each other. So there's probably something to that. Uh, and I'm guessing that's where they're probably coming from. But we live in a, again, we don't live in a different time. It's exactly what it is today where somebody can say, you misidentified me or you purposely said something that, you know, you knew that if you called me the wrong pronoun, that I would be so enraged 
that you would be responsible for what comes next. Some that's what they're pretty much trying to argue now. And one of the things that really you know burns my bacon about this is just how inconsistent the Supreme Court has been in determining what constitutes fighting words and what doesn't. I mean, there's been Supreme Court cases where they basically decided that all the following do not constitute the fighting words doctrine. Flag burning doesn't constitute it. Uh, if you wear a sticker that says, fuck the draft in a courtroom, that does not constitute fighting words. Uh, you know, telling the cops to, you know, eat shit does not count as fighting words. Protesting the funerals of soldiers like Fred Phelps did, not considered fighting words. But then at the same time, you have decisions like Terminello versus the city of Chicago and Finer versus New York, where the Supreme Court says, well, you know, we can still actually limit things as long as it's done under, and this is the really important, you know, keyword take away from all this, content neutral standards of enforcement. So when we use the word content neutral or, you know, categorical neutral, what exactly does that mean legally? Uh, basically that there is no... Uh, ideological reason for the law that they're uh, they're prohibiting a kind of speech and it's not it's not the idea behind the speech to just how you express it and uh, this would just be a pure expression of a non-political idea and I, again they kind of reference it and I, I think the way you could think of it is fuck the draft is protected because you're making a political uh, message at that point. It's, it is very clear that you are because you're referencing the draft. Nobody would, you know, nobody would wear fuck the draft for any reasons that aren't political. It would pretty much be a fair statement as opposed to somebody that just maybe had a, a t-shirt that just said fuck on it and they had no political message. Now, again, I would actually argue nowadays that that in and of itself would be a political message because you're trying to stir up shit, but you, you could probably at the time they would say, well, nobody would wear anything that says fuck for the hell of it. So if you did work for the hell of it, you'd be just provoking people. And I guess they didn't want people to be provoked in certain ways. Yeah. And one of the more interesting cases we've had about this particular content based censorship is uh, from 1992. It's called RAV versus city of St. Paul. And if you're ever in, any, you know, introductory journalism law course, you know about this one. Some kid, you know, torched a cross on his black neighbor's yard, and basically what it did was it struck down one of um, a Minnesota ordinance about uh, hate speech. And it's one of the first, I think, in the nation to ever actually specifically address that kind of idea. And uh, obviously that decision said that that particular law was overbroad, it was content-based, but then, you know, you flash forward to 2003 and you have a Supreme Court case basically going over the exact same material called Virginia versus Black, ironically enough. <laughs> and uh, basically they ruled that, you know, while cross burning was still unconstitutional, was unconstitutional. No, wait, hold on. Let me go back. Virginia's law against cross burning was unconstitutional. It did also kind of walk away with this idea that as long as the defendant can show a burden of proof that the symbolic speech was meant to be intimidation, that can be considered unconstitutional. And I'm wondering, you know, how exactly that possibly play into some of the hate speech proposals or anti-free speech proposals we have going up on college campuses now. How can they possibly, you know, use that and weaponize that against people who just want to speak their mind? I, I think that, again, they would have a, so far, a giant uphill climb. And I think what the court was trying to get at there is you basically can't use um, political speech as a shield to, in actuality, do something harmful or bad. And, yes, setting aside how difficult it would be to prove what your intentions are, if you were, we'll say, uh, David Duke, and there was an audio recording of you saying, I'm going to burn this cross in, in this black people's yard because I want them to know that I'm coming to get them and kill them and I hope that this makes them leave or something like that. You could then say he's not burning the cross in front of their yard for a political reason. He's doing it to actually harm these people and to intimidate them. And we don't allow, again, rightfully so, nobody thinks that a, 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 a legitimate in, in, uh, fighting, again, legitimate intimidation of, I'm going to hurt you right now. Like, 
just because they're words doesn't mean that it's speech. And I think that's what they're trying to get at, but they'll probably just never define it, but they just want to leave open the possibility so that one day they don't get overruled. or They leave, they leave future courts that wiggle room, basically. And there's a very important term which came into the lexicon in 1969 with Brandenburg versus Ohio. Imminent lawless action. And for the people who are not familiar with this law, once again it involves a clan. Somehow they get involved in all these First Amendment cases. Uh, there was a guy in Ohio, and he basically did like this long meandering screed against uh, all these minorities on TV. And he was arrested under an Ohio state law against criminal syndicalism. And uh, basically, they went to the Supreme Court and they overturned his conviction because uh, they said the law prohibited the mere advocacy of violence. So if you're just advocating an unpersonal, non-directional form of violence, which they considered imminent lawless action, it's protected speech. So basically, you know, what's the framework there? I mean, how is that applied and what do you actually have to do to define imminent lawless action? I think that um, you could think of it as you never want to say that a call for for violence is always prohibited because again, that's so easy to be read as anything that would be written against the government, therefore undermining the government, and the and then all interruptions would always be violent or something like that. You know, call, a call to arms, the phrase a call to arms could be dangerous. We saw the founding fathers. You know, you absolutely have the right to discuss, at least in philosophical terms, when it would be appropriate for violence to be used, as opposed to the imminent sighting of lawless behavior would be essentially you're you're you got the microphone, and this is what they try to claim about Trump. But imagine a scenario where Trump's doing a, a rally, and in in walks Elizabeth Warren, and Trump yells, "Everybody, get her, beat her, beat her, stone her, hit her, kill her," and he really and then people start doing it. And then he goes, yeah, keep doing it. Hit her harder, hit her harder. Well, he would not be able to say, that's just speech. I can say whatever I want. I'm not responsible in any way. Because clearly the crowd responded to what he said, and he was leading them and egging them on in the same way. And you, you couldn't be like a mafia don and say, I may have said to do it, but he was still the one that did it. I'm just saying things. Therefore, I need to be protected. And we just rightfully go, no, that's not how you get around things in life. And that's a perfect segue to yet another very opaque uh, Supreme Court term, true threats. Going back to 1969, there was a case called Watts versus U.S., and I believe it revolved around, I think it was a, it was either a, a faculty or a professor at some you know, high school was giving a speech, and he said, you know, if he was ever drafted, the first person he'd shoot was LBJ, and everybody in the crowd laughed and ended up, you know, getting uh, arrested for it, charged with something, and ended up getting all the way up to the Supreme Court. And uh, basically what that was, and the holding was that, uh, you know, he couldn't really be arrested because it was obviously hyperbolic, and there's a fine line between something that's really exaggerated like that and what they call true threats. But, of course, the problem with this, and you see this across the board with some of these Supreme Court decisions, they never actually define what that is. So just, uh, you know, contemporarily, when we use the term true threats in the legal sense today, what does that mean? Is there a, a strict definition, or is it still just completely just abstract? Um, I think it's more or less abstract. But it's true, like I just kind of gave the example before of, you know, inciting violence. That's like a true threat. And I think that they know that to out and out define it is be very difficult. The, the pornography deal. I may not know it, but I know it when I see it. And you're like, you'll kind of know it when you hear it. And I think it's just, again, as a general principle, that is the way that the world works. That's the appropriate way society works. And that we will just, as a group, figure out what goes over the line and they're just saying look there is a line we all know there's a line because we don't live in a world where just because you say something means it is always you're not responsible for your consequences you can't just again lie about somebody and then when you when they're damaged just go see i just speaking so i think it's you know it's a very very narrow distinction but there is a difference there and i think that's what they're 
kind of just setting a principle there, uh, uh, setting forth the general principle. And, uh, you know, we're seeing it now in, you know, Evergreen there in uh, Washington, where, again, the, the language that the protesters and all the youth are using, it's very similar to this kind of language. They're saying, no, 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 this is the kind of speech that we all know isn't appropriate. And I think that they'll eventually lose if this goes on for too much. But it's, you know, I guess it's just kind of the pragmatist to me as a lawyer just goes, society's going to change on this stuff. That's just how it works and it may not be right, but you can't really force the future to live 100% by the rules of the past. And whenever you talk about the relevancy of the Constitution in regards to contemporary law, you know, every time you hear someone talk about the Second Amendment, you always hear the caveat, well, you know, back then they didn't have, you know, semi-automatic weapons. You had muskets and that was it. Well, I mean, along those same lines, I'm pretty sure John Adams and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, you know, when they're thinking of free expression, they were thinking literally the one printing press you had in Philadelphia and a quill. And now we have this entire global electronic social media network. And, uh... There's a very important case, which I kind of think slipped under the radar in 2015, called Alonis versus the United States. And I think this is kind of giving us an indication of where things are headed in the future, because obviously it's going to be a big, you know, brouhaha legally at some point. And what happened in that one, there's this guy who I think actually has quoted like a, a rap song from The Wise Kid You Know, and he just changed the lyrics from the president to his ex-wife. And he was basically arrested for that and charged with making violent threats. And then the outcome of this one, it's a very, you know, I, I read these all the time just for entertainment. It's one of my, my hobbies, going through First Amendment laws. But even reading this one, it's so opaque that I, I'm going to need someone who has more experience with law to actually kind of get down to the granular details of what this is. But the holding from that is the court's instruction that requires only negligence or the spec to the communication of a threat is not sufficient to support a conviction. Um, just in, you know, the layman terms, what the hell are they trying to say? I think that the guy was, I presume, initially convicted under the theory that his actions were negligent. That is to say, uh, a, a reasonable person in, those situ in that situation would have known better. And the court's basically saying negligence is not a, a good enough standard if you're going to basically suppress what would have been before. Let's see, it's not a good enough standard to suppress any kind of speech. You have to show something more than just negligence. Okay. And if there's anything that, you know, these true threat Supreme Court cases have taught me, it's the more extravagant and more unrealistic you make your threat, the less likely you'll go to jail for. So just yeah. Little, a little tip for all the kids out there. Don't say you want to kill your teacher. Say you want to, you know, kill your teacher with, you know, a jello dildo or something. Yeah, it's, you know, the old idea. The we all Again, we all know this. If somebody says, I'm going to kill you, you go, ha, ha, ha. And if somebody goes, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to take out. And the more details you add to it, the more real it becomes. I think it's just maybe a storytelling thing in our head. But we know when somebody tells me how graphic it is. And they have all these details. That means they've thought about this before, and there is something there to it. So okay. I'm saying, what I'm telling the kids out there is, uh, keep your journal about all your violent fantasies private to yourself, and burn it after your first kill. That is sound advice from a person in Illinois who's actually credited to be a lawyer. So go with it. Hey, damn right, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry to the future generations when I'm running for president. And I have to explain this one to a wolf blizzard's uh, clone, but uh, I wasn't... Yeah, let the kids die. It's fine. Yeah, we'll make sure Supreme Court Justice Kid Rock gets you off. Don't worry. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, he'll... Uh, I can't even think of any of his songs to make it some sort of legal-related pun, so I'm just going to move on. All right. And uh, I'm going to give you one guess as to what I consider to be the most terrifying Supreme Court decision of all time. Can you take a wild guess what that one is? Uh... Remember, I come from a journalist background, so this one... Yeah, I was trying to think. I'm like, well, you're not going to see Marbury versus Madison. Um, the most terrifying one for journalists. Well, I mean, this is really for all Americans, actually. Now that I think but, yeah, but, but journalism, I think, journalism hasn't had a ton of real big 
big losses uh, really over the years. Um, you really don't like Lawrence v. Texas. Of course. How did you know? <laughs> yeah. Or Ferber versus New York. That's the other big one. Yeah. Or you, you know what? You just hate Griswold versus Connecticut. I get it. It's fine. You want? You don't like condoms. We're all. We've all been there. Uh, it's just the worst. The one I was thinking about because it it's number one. It's still the legal precedent. It's the, the standard we use. It's been on the books for you know almost fifty years now, and it's just so incredibly abstract and metaphysical. And there's no way to to prove anything in it. It's just so subjective. Miller versus California. Oh yeah, I remember Miller a little bit. Which, uh, and this is important to know because I know a lot of people don't really stay in the loop about this, but there are hundreds, maybe even thousands of people in the U.S. now who are in jail right now under obscenity convictions. Uh, a good idea is this, uh, the guy who ran uh, Extreme Pro Wrestling, Rob Black. Oh, yeah. He was actually booked on federal obscenity charges for basically, I think it was like sending like... Uh, like a minute-long clip of pornography over you know, state lines. Not illegal porn, just regular old-fashioned porn over state lines. And uh, for those of you who don't know the definition of Miller California, it sets the slaps test for what constitutes obscenity. And I'll just read it real quick because it's very stupid and it terrifies me knowing that this is the only thing really keeping you and me out of jail right now is this sliver right here. Obscene materials are defined as those that the average person applying contemporary True. community standards find taken as a whole appeal to the prudent interest the depictor <laughs> describe in a patently offensive way sexual conduct or excretory functions specifically defined by applicable state law and that the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. Now, I don't know about you, but there's at least like four or five self-contradictions in there. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a screwy one. It's, the only thing I can really say in its defense is, again, it's articulating an idea that we know that, I guess the society wants to say that there are certain types of uh, expressions of ideas that, I don't. I don't know, man. It's really tough on this one. It's the only thing in his defense is it hasn't been really abused in a re like. It's not being lower to suppress anything besides something that really the only reason anybody would defend it is because you're a free speech defender, which I ex accept. But nobody's gonna like pretty much buy it or, or really think it's helping people. But. <sighs> Uh, it's it's a crap decision. It's 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 too vague, but it's too vague because there's no other way for it to be but vague. Vague because it's one of those weird topics that I I don't like it. I think you have a bright line. It's you know as long as something illegal doesn't happen on camera, oh, go for it, man. So that's all on you. So I'm trying to like see this. Okay, so if it lacks a serious artistic or political value. Does that mean I can do whatever, like, obscure and violent and degrading pornography as long as they're, like, reading Shakespeare? Uh, yeah, probably. I think that they're really just, uh, honestly, you probably could argue it on some level there. I think that, you know, again, when you look at what they, the cases where these things have come up, generally, they're, the stuff involved, the, the art, it's never one of those, like, gray areas, like, oh, well, yeah, I can kind of see the, the message he's getting at there. It's... It's something that just appeals, like they say, to our prurient interest in nature, which again, we all know that we have that part of us that's just pure animal. And I guess they're saying we shouldn't indulge that. And maybe that's the right thing to do. I don't know. Again, I don't really, I hate to rule in these cases because it, it seems like it's a clear cut deal, but in the real world, you know, we do have real world, uh, real world repercussions for our perfect uh, philosophical ends. There are just so many things. Like, I'm counting up in my head now. There's at least six or seven things in here which I know for a fact have no legal definition whatsoever. And the fact that this has been the utmost obscenity, you know, case for the last 50 years with no updates whatsoever, no clarifications, 
really causes me a lot of distress, you know, and I'm trying to fall asleep late at night. I just have a feeling that this can kind of be worked around and used for nefarious purposes a little bit later down the road, but we'll move along to something called viewpoint discrimination. We'll get through this very quickly, because I know everybody's getting bored with this legal terminology stuff. Uh, so yeah, 1995, there's a case called Rosenberger versus Rectors and Visitors in the University of Virginia. And uh, just read very quickly from the holding, uh, other things being equal, viewpoint discrimination occurs when government allows one message while prohibiting the messages of those who can reasonably be expected to respond. Now in this case, it's about using tuition money for religious organizations and non-religious organizations. But I think maybe just that standard definition of viewpoint discrimination may go a long way in perhaps sort of deterring you know, some of these very Orwellian-like hate speech laws in the U.S. So you think that's enough of a deterrent? Is that a strong enough wall, or can that also kind of be tweaked every now and then? Uh, I would like to think that it's strong enough, and it probably will be good enough for our lifetime. But again, we see, we mentioned it earlier in the show, about people inverting the definition of things and actually engaging in Orwellianism. The problem with that is, in Orwellian world, they can just make up new meanings for words. So they can just apply whatever they want. If, if it says, uh, you know, you can never say hello on a Friday, they'll just say, well, that's not, we don't use the word Friday anymore. We call it first day or something. So therefore it doesn't apply. And you'll be like, oh, okay, that's a weird one. So uh, again, these things are only as strong as basically we as people believe them to be strong. All their power derives from our collective, basically, our, again, it's our collective will. It's us giving them that authority, and if they overdo it, then nobody's going to care, and nobody's going to listen, and uh, then you just become ineffectual, and then they're just like any other branch of the government, basically. And uh, to kind of bring things full circle, to the best of my knowledge, there's never actually been a Supreme Court case directly dealing with the topic of hate speech laws or, you know, hate speech ordinances, anything of that nature. But what we did have, and I think this is a very, very big president earlier this year, actually it's a couple of days ago, uh, the decision in Mattel versus Tam. Uh, basically what this was, there's a band called the Slants, and they applied for patent protection under the, uh, you know, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and they turned it down because they said it was discriminatory and offensive. And basically... What the Supreme Court recently decided was, okay, well, the Lanham Act says that you can't turn down people's trademarks and patents for things because you think it's offensive. And the thing that I really like about this, it wasn't like a 5-4 decision. I mean, this was an 8 no call. Even Ginsburg voted against it and upheld the First Amendment. So, uh, and there's a quote from my read a little bit later on, which I think is a really good segue point to wrap up this whole discussion. But where do you see this kind of moving forward legally, you know, I mean, where do you think the next big Supreme Court decision will be on the subject of hate speech ordinances and hate speech laws? I would imagine that there's probably going to be something arising out of what we see right now as far as can, can, can government entities, in this case would be probably be universities, try to use what you know can they pull a berkeley can they go out there and essentially create a situation through their inaction that therefore grants them permission to act and do what they wanted to do can you basically you know stir up the pot so much by never even trying to stop these whack job kids from getting out of control and therefore you can say oh yeah it's out of control that's why we had to cancel the speech maybe the, the supreme court might be saying no, sorry. Again, fight is a, a passive fighting words. You knew exactly what would happen if you let that go on, and you didn't, and you guys can't really do that. Now, let's read a very quick quote from Justice Kennedy and the uh, decision here. A law that can be directed against speech found offensive to some portion of the public can be turned against minority and dissenting views to the detriment of all. The First Amendment does not entrust that power to the government's benevolence. Instead, our reliance must be on the substantial safeguards of free and open discussion in a democratic society. Well, to me, that sounds pretty black and white, but there's something that has kind of been stuck in my craw for quite some time. 
And that's why our hate speech ordinances and other campus speech codes legal. Uh, specifically at state schools where not only are they publicly subsidized, where the employees, the teachers, the faculty professors themselves are actually literally considered state employees. Yeah, uh, I don't think that they will be for long. I think that this decision just a couple of days ago, when you said, you know, it's surprising they're so strong, it was eight, eight nothing in voting. That's not an accident. I've been reading about how Chief Justice Roberts, he wants a lot more decisions like this that will, you know, be decisions that go out in public that basically say, you know, we're the branch of the government that is different. We're not crazy. We can get along. And so they're not going to be taking on super controversial things where it's going to be narrow five, four wins. They're going to focus on these kind of broader issues where they can come out in super strong terms and say, this is what it is. And that'll have a lot more uh, precedential value going forward because any decision is five, four, everybody goes, you know, it's a very divided court shows how close the issue was once eight, nothing, you know, a future court are going to have a real tough time undoing that. And I think that's, Again, that's why they're picking what I would call an, an easy one in, in this situation where they're flat saying, no, you, you can't you can't just you can't discriminate that way. Um, as far as why these state schools and all that can get away with this stuff so far is it just hasn't come up. It's, that's the simple practical answer is that this issue has not been really identified directly by the Supreme Court yet. And so the campuses are doing whatever they kind of want. And, most people shrug and they go, ah, those crazy kids in college, what are you going to do? Like, that's just what they do. Oh, we used to burn our bras, and now they're silencing dissenting opinion. <laughs> kids will be kids. Yeah, and in 2015, uh, the Pew Research came out with a study that said about 40% of millennials are A-OK -okay with the idea of limiting, which, of course, you know, read between the lines, outlawing. Uh, language which is offensive to minorities. And I think we've got to play devil's advocate, or angel's advocate, perhaps, depending on perspective. You know, racism and homophobia and, you know, Islamophobia, all this stuff I think we can agree upon. You know, just uh, structurally, we all agree that they're bad. I mean, no one's going to argue, unless they're like really hardcore, you know, neo-Nazis, that they're positive things. So, you know, if the majority of Americans think they're bad, and of course, nearly a majority of uh, millennials think it's bad, why not illegalize and criminalize hate speech, these things that are considered offensive by so many people? Um, point blank, uh, times change, and you don't know if you're right. We've seen just too many examples over history of the majority of people being very, very sure of something, and they're wrong you know think about it we saw what happened in a, in a very real level the catholic church with galileo and copernicus they were 100 percent wrong and yet the vast majority of people at that time would have told you the earth is flat to such a degree probably in numbers far uh, uh outstri outstripping our current numbers on what good and bad and they were 100 percent wrong and so you don't know. I mean, what seems appalling to us today may just be our own ignorance, and we're not. We can't assume that we're that wise. It may. What if they do a DNA genetic thing or whatever, and they find an actual gene that says black people are inferior? Like all, like I don't know what it, how you do it, but you would have just tried to suppress that, and we would lose a fact. We would lose truth and the whole point of freedom of speech and all these rules and rights is to find the ultimate truth of things so i'm i'm saying i like free speech i, I can't argue against that and uh you know of course there's a term that's been around since the late 1980s but it's only recently kind of come into vogue is sort of a mainstream term intersectionality and i think this has a lot to do with the way uh, kids nowadays look at the idea of you know free speech and free expression so have we gotten to a point now where you know identity politics and you know herd tribalism has gotten so strong in this country that we've kind of collectively decided that those are actually more important than the rights of the individual and what do you think causes that and what do you think the ultimate social outcomes will be of this kind of thing happening 
I think the ultimate outcome if this does come to pass is only negative. It's there's never been an example in history when the country had fewer freedoms and was better. It, it just it doesn't work that way. I, as far as what kind of caused it, again, we've been kind of going around this all show trying to figure out what exactly is the reason for for all this with these kids and what they're doing. And I think you know, another possibility is you're seeing what happens when you've had a generation plus of nothing but one political party essentially breaking groups down into their minute differences. And so you have all these people that the party has said, you are black, you are woman, and you are gay. Because all of you have been oppressed in some way, you're all the exact same. And when you try to figure out, well, how are we all the exact same? Because you want to have like something that isn't cynical. Because it's cynical to say that you're all the same because you're all this weak or, or you know, you're all the same because, oh, yeah, but you're all different, but you're all the same in these weak ways or whatever. So you try to figure out, well, what's really going on? And you try to, your overarching principle becomes this, inter, this idea of intersectionality where it's, it's literally just a fancy convoluted way of being a racist. It's just trying to come up with convoluted logic like there's always been throughout history to justify racism. It, you know, at one time it was the inferiority of the, of, the, of the black man's mental aspect and, oh, he'd be, you know, a brute on the streets and now it's ascribing group guilt to all people who are white because they're the only people that aren't all white men because that's the only people that don't get counted in the intersectionality and if that's the case if it's only if only straight white men one very easy to define group of people aren't part of that they're therefore being left out of it they're being discriminated against now, can you think of any uh, previous historical antecedents where some of this happened, where one particular subset of the general population was chosen as the root of all evil and everything wrong in society? Preferably somewhere around Europe, between the years 1932 and 1945? Um, yeah, I think that was the time when the Swedes looked down on the Norwegians. Or maybe it was the other way around. They were very particular about who's bluish, whose eyes were bluer, and the darker the blue, the more awful and evil you were. Yeah, there there's, might be some irony in the fact that people who are always calling the political other Nazis are the ones who are employing the most Nazi-like rhetoric in their day-to-day -day discourse. Yeah, again, it comes down to people don't have a core value. They don't understand what is important. They don't understand why the Nazis were bad. They, you know, they were obviously bad. But they don't understand what was wrong with what they were doing. And it wasn't just killing people. It's this unwillingness to listen to anybody else and then to demonize your, your opponents. And they didn't, under, they didn't pick that up. It, they're just simple children. They're just not smart enough to get it, I guess. Because anybody with half a brain picks it up right away. And so they're just... Uh, you see, again, you look at Germany right now. Germany, every other day, seems to have some stupid law getting passed and enforced. You know, we see it in pro wrestling. You wrestlers can't pretend to be a, a Nazi, not march around the ring. That's uh, hate speech and all this stuff. And it's just funny as hell that their brilliant answer to uh, hate speech, to, to their brilliant answer to the uh, all evil of suppression of speech, which was just to go out and suppress more speech. They just can't help themselves. They're not killing people in the streets yet, but shit, the Nazi party didn't start off killing people in the streets. Every fascist thinks that they're doing the right thing in the end. You know, that reminds me, at some point in the future, like maybe around WrestleMania, we need to do another podcast about brazenly racist stereotypes in wrestling. Oh boy, that's a long one. <laughs> yeah, seriously, I've been compiling some early information. You know, there is some amazing stuff, but we'll, we'll save that for later. I mean, shit, they got one right now. Jinder Mahal. Oh, yeah, yeah. I forgot about that one. I was thinking more like there was actually a uh, guy who was named the Stormtrooper, like in the early 1990s. Oh, that's fantastic. He would come out wearing a Nazi helmet and march around the oh, ring. <sighs> oh, what a hero. What a, you know what? That's why pro wrestling is great. It understands that the masses 
have this desire for very simple black and white, good versus bad, kind of just throwback simplicity and storytelling that you don't get anywhere else. And you get to watch violence, but nobody gets hurt. It's just perfect. Yeah, it's my favorite stupid thing in the entire world, and I, I can't get enough of it. That NASCAR, like, I've become more and more a fan of NASCAR. I don't know who anybody is, but I just see an ESPN all the time, so I kind of pick up some of the names. I'll just like, have it on. I'll just watch it kind of this stupor of, this is so stupid. Like, people are just sitting and literally, you know, as the hack joke goes, they're just watching people drive around in a circle, and yet they fucking love it. And you know what? There's something so simple about the idea of a race. Who runs the fastest? There's no... There's no, nothing convoluted about that. You don't need to know anything in the world. You just need to go, okay, that guy got across the line first. Yeah, obviously he wins. It's perfect. Well, you know, the sort of uh, as a proud Southerner myself, you know, I always have to kind of explain to people, okay, well, yeah, it's a little weird. You know, you're sitting in this, you know, 200,000 person size stadium watching guys go in a loop, you know, for six hours. But I mean, you know, what is the more cultured thing to do? You go to a modern art museum and you stare at a giant canvas with just splattered paint blobs on it and you try to make sense of it. You know, you're just applying whatever abstract things in your head on this invisible canvas. So, I mean, I think we're all guilty of it, no matter what our uh, socioeconomic norms or cultural tastes are. And plus, again, like if 200,000 people are engaging in the communal activity, you, you, there's something to that. It, it doesn't matter if you know what it is. You just you can't. You have to be respectful and acknowledge that it exists. It's like when Donald Trump won the presidency. You don't have to like that, like him. You don't have to like that he won. But you damn well better figure out why he did, so you can address that in the future. Okay, real, real quick plug. You can read about that. Listen to it. Not economically viable. Episode one. Jim Goad. We just a couple days ago. It's available Ooh. on the website. So you definitely want to check that out. That's all. Oh, I'm going to check that out for sure. I love Jim Goad. Yeah, he's a great guy. And, uh, man, how do we get sidetracked? That's surprising. I, I, I tend to have that effect in the world. You know, that, that's why you're a favorite uh, satirical mixed martial artist niche website host. I you know. It's like I was blessed and ordained to do this by the Lord himself. Praise be upon him or whatever I'm supposed to say. Yes. Thank you, based Hoist Gracie. Hey, there you go. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, slightly getting back on the topic of uh, hate speech laws and free expression in this day and age, one of the interesting cultural things I've noticed is we've kind of seen like a totally Nietzschean transvaluation of societal norms, where if you go back, you know, 50, 60 years ago, Berkeley was like the vanguard of free speech. And it was all these right-wing groups like the John Birch Society and you know, even McCarthyists that were trying to silence everyone you know, threatening to make them lose their jobs, do all this stuff. And now here we are 60 years down the road and there's been a total reversal where now it's almost like, you know, the hardcore rice, you know, for all their, you know, failings and failures, they're the ones standing up for free expression while the liberal tolerant left are the ones trying to destroy the First Amendment. Yeah, it, it used to be the, the adults were telling the kids settle down and now it's kids telling the adults to settle down in a much larger way and it's it doesn't make any sense and you just hope that when they grow up to be adults that they don't have the same dumb mindset because otherwise then they turn into nazis and eventually those passive nazis become real nazis i uh it's just it's, again it's baffling to me that we live in a time where people really don't understand that just because your feelings are hurt doesn't mean you undo the most basic principle that exists. And that's that's a really good point because when you look at what these kids are doing, and it's not just kids. I mean, there's like, you know, 60-year-old hippies who are totally on this bandwagon of, you know, rounding up everyone who has maybe like alt-right convictions, you know, and putting them in prison or, you know, deleting them from Facebook and all these, you know, other forms of uh, neo-censorship. And I'm kind of wondering, you know, do you think that these people are pressing for hate speech laws or anti-expression ordinances because they legitimately feel harmed by it or because it kind of feeds into their identitarian narcissism? You know, they're virtue signaling not for civil rights, but just for affirmation from their peers. 
I think that those are what's an Arubis or whatever. Uh, that's just a, a, a snake feeding on his tail. It's a self. It's a self perpetuating loop. You know, they virtue signal to the point where they, you know, you tell a lie enough, you start to believe it yourself, and at a certain point, you have no idea with chicken or egg. And I think that's what they're at right now. And it sucks. You can just hope that the people who are um, not of that mindset outnumber them and can convince all the people who are in the middle who haven't really thought it through. And when push comes to shove, they'll have to. And that, uh, in that sense, I guess I have a little bit of hope because I think that uh, something that good, great, and powerful in the world, people really eventually go, yeah, we got to have that. And, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, what do you think the people who are so adamantly opposed to, you know, so-called hate speech or want stricter free expression rules, ultimately, what do they want? You know, are they aiming for some sort of, you know, financial benefit? Is it just about being a power grab? Are they just transparently afraid of criticism? I mean, what's, you know, the impetus for it? I would think that initially they come from a, a place of good heart, I would think, and they do have a sincere belief. I think that the problem is, is that they get rewarded for that belief, and it's you know an unchallenged belief. It's difficult to know if you really you know have it held close to your heart, whereas if you suffer repercussions because you do something, then you ask yourself, do I really believe this? And that forces you to question what you believe. And maybe you're wrong, but you've you know, at least got to question it. But when you just can virtue signal, and you could really mean it, and then somebody goes, yeah, you're doing a good thing. Well, damn it, you know, you give, if every time the dog sits down and you give him a cookie, he's going to sit down all the time to the point where you will rewire his brain because, you know, that lizard, lizard part of our brain doesn't go away. Well, yeah, and you go to the whole Orwellian concept, or, you know, there's actually a lot of, you know, speech pathologists that come out and tell you this from a constructionist mentality, that, you know, language dictates thought. I mean, you can't literally think without thinking in terms of the language you've learned. And, I mean, there's a very strong argument to be said that if you're able to control language and what's acceptable and what's mainstream and what's, you know, the official preferred terminology, that you can actually control the way people think. You can control ideologies. And I mean, you know, whoever would have thought, you know, that in 1991, that if you go into a college campus and you said there are two genders, you could be expelled. Well, you would have also at the same time said, oh, by the way, uh, Donald Trump is president of the United States. And everybody would have gone, that's it. I'm checking out now. It, maybe that's what happened to Kurt Cobain. Somebody came and told him, and he just goes, I'm not going to live through that crazy time. And you miss Foo Fighters. That's the worst part. Well, it'd be fine to get rid of Foo Fighters for a little bit more Nirvana. I'll, I'll go with that deal. And I'm trying to think, you know, uh, I'd give them both up for a little bit more Lane Staley. That's because you're from the South. No, oh, never mind. That's Allison yeah. Chains. Yeah, I know. I was just like, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I would, uh, ooh, wait. I mean, if you, I don't really care about Foo Fighters too much. Uh, I'm a, and I, I keep Nirvana over Allison Chain. Allison Chain just always annoys me, even though I think it's because like they, they always played Man in the Box so much on the radio that I just get annoyed with that sound. But then after a while, I, I listen and go, "Man, this is really good stuff." But Nirvana, and I just have happy. You know what? Fuck it. I'll take more Allison Chains because Nirvana has happy memories in my life because they never had a chance to become repetitive. So uh, keep that alive. Sorry, Kurt, you have to die. Yep. Well, you know, at least he went out doing what he loved best, overdosing on heroin. We could, we should all be so lucky. You know, and one of the things that I've noticed about seemingly every single group throughout history which has sought to censor things, going back to the Spanish Inquisition, to the McCarthyists, to today's social justice warriors, the underlying philosophical principle that I keep seeing over and over again is these people are gloriously, gloriously insecure of their own convictions. I think that's, yeah, it, it's, uh, if you believe that your stuff is 
really true and right, then I think you have to believe in that it will win out. I mean, I think it shows a, a lack of faith in themselves, and it shows a lack of faith in humanity, and it really comes from a place of ego where I know best, and that they're insecure about it. So, again, they feed on themselves where they have to prove that they are the best, to satisfy that part of them that thinks that they're not better than people. And it just, again, it gets feedback loop. It goes on and on and on in a circle. And we can only hope that maybe one day you stick a spoke in there and they trip. Yeah, and I, there's an old saying, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. I mean, that's something you learn in preschool. But today's generation, for whatever reason, they are wholeheartedly convinced that you know, calling someone, you know, a racial star, or not even that, like something as innocuous as dumb or stupid or lame, is literally the same thing as punching them in the face or throwing a brick through their windshield. So yeah, where, no. where did that come from? I mean, how? Uh, they're just coddled. It's just a different, different life experiences, I guess. To me, I will say that as a writer, I always kind of, I think that there's a little bit of a, almost an inherent... Um, well, a paradox with basically all expression in writing, because if you say, how could this hurt? How could this, you know, to hurt, to change something, to do something different in the world? Well, if it can't, then why are you doing it? Like, I like to think that I could write in such a way that it would hurt somebody, like if I wanted to, or it would cause an emotion or a reaction. It, it can be that powerful. But no, you're right in that. I think we all need to understand you can have your feelings. You just have to accept the rest of the world for the, if, even if it's for a, a very selfish reason of it's your suicide pact. And since you both don't want to die, you'll both kind of keep playing the game and you can never be sure that the other person is going to, you know, not drop the gun or whatever. So you, you just do it that way. But that's, again, they're just, they're, I think this is ration, rational people trying to understand the irrational. This could just be some weird form of mass hysteria. And, you know, I'm only going to assume that eventually some, uh, you know, liberal social justice warrior type people are going to get a hold of this. And obviously the first thing they're going to do is going to write off everything we say as being inconsequential because, you know, to the best of my knowledge, we're both, you know, white, Judeo-Christian cisgendered, heterosexual, on my part at least, males. And therefore, what do we know about the harm that, you know, gays or Latinos or African Americans go through? So, I mean, is there any sort of merit to that? I mean, that, uh, you know, because we haven't lived through those experiences, that we really don't have the ability to tell people that these words don't constitute physical harm? There is on the surface, but when I go deeper below it, you realize that there isn't. I'm willing to accept that being, let's say, minorities and women, minorities and women, people, the non-whites of the world, have suffered. They have felt some sort of weird oppression or, or whatever it may be historically. Whether that is just now is a great debate. But I'll accept that, yeah, of course it's more difficult being black. Of course it's more difficult being a woman, historically. So they do feel something that I can never feel problem is when you feel something that you know the other side can never feel that means you know that that feeling exists in the world and you have to accept that the other person also feels something that you yourself will never feel and so therefore you have to accept that you're not right and uh so by saying the yeah, yes you and i are limited because we're not black women but they should know that they too are limited because they're not white men and so they don't know when we actually would be oppressed, if, it, if the pendulum ever does swing too far the other way, they already know that the oppressor doesn't never knows what he's doing, and so they should have to admit that they could be the oppressor, and therefore not to assume that whitey is all racist. But they probably won't get there for a long time. Yeah, and speaking of long times, one of the things I do, and maybe this is a positive move to negative, I try to think about things 100 years in the future before I... I mull any huge, major, you know, constitution-defining changes to whatever, laws of lexicon. And, you know, you look at all these, you know, demographic predictions. I mean, by 2100, 
I mean, not only are whites expected to be a you know, minority, I mean, they're going to be a legit minority. 2100 comes around, there's going to be more Hispanics than whites in the U.S. So, I mean, what happens in the long haul when you have that sort of, you know, jihad against a certain subset of the population? Do you just switch the, the lashing stick back and forth indefinitely every 100 years? I don't really, I mean, maybe. I, I look at 100 years from now, and I think in a funny way, a hundred years from now, America will still be the most powerful, or I should say the most powerful, will be the most, will be the safest from all the ex- extra crap out there. Because I think that we eventually will just uh, probably progress towards a liberal socialist state like they have over in Europe. And Europe is going to keep sliding further and further within themselves. The problem with that is, is that Europe has an existential threat in the form of what we could call maybe the Great Arab or great Muslim migration that's happening right now, which is truly changing the very face and values of Europe itself. Whereas America, our biggest form would come from Mexico, but Mexicans, you know, Latin America has a lot of liberal socialist democratic type of uh, ideas, at least it may not be practiced, but the idea of, you know, the government having more power to control money and, and spread the wealth and all that. That does exist down there. So America should probably much be safe where the worst case scenario is we're kind of like Europe today, which maybe that's not the best, but it'll be better than what Europe's going to be like in 100 years. And if there's anything I think of when I hear the word economic stability, it's Mexico. Well, you know, they got uh, all the – everybody knows that good economies are built on the backs of poor people, and that's why all these really poor countries uh, have so much great – wealth yet to be created because they're just waiting for those poor people to be taken advantage of. Hey, well, I mean, let's not discount Carlos Slim at one point, the world's richest man, Mexico City uh, businessman. Yeah, you know, he's a, he's a winner. It was New York Times now. Got that thing, that scam going. And, uh, you know, we've covered so much territory and I want to kind of wind down to the final question. But first, I just want to do a, a little anecdote. I was thinking about this earlier day when I was driving around. Uh, there is a specific point in my life, and it doesn't matter what color you are, what gender you are, whatever, whatever quantifier you want to use. At some point in our lives, we all experience discrimination. We all have people say things to us that, you know, really make us feel bad and cause us, you know, maybe not physical harm, but emotional harm. And uh, very quick story time, and that'll be our segue into the final question. I remember one time I was in elementary school, and uh, I grew up poor as dirt, and one of the kids in the playground called me trailer trash. And for whatever reason, that just really got under my skin, and I felt really pissy about it for a week. And uh, on the weekends, I'd go over to my grandpa's place, and he was a good dude who literally fought Nazis. I mean, he lied about his age. He was like 15 (laughs) to go into World War II. So whatever problems you may have had in your life ever, or nothing compared to this guy I went through, and I went to him because, you know, he's your your spirit guy, the voice of reason. And I'm like, you know, Grandpa, there's this kid at school. He called me trailer trash, and you know, I'm still kind of torn up about it. And he was sitting on his knee, and he said, "Well, you know, son, do you think you're trailer trash?" And I go, "Well, no." And he's like, "Well, if you know you're not trailer trash, then why do you care what other people think?" And I'm wondering, you know. Why can't we have that be sort of our guiding ethics on free expression? I mean, if you're not all these bad things that people, Matt, say, you know, if you know for a fact they're not true, then why would you get so worked up about it? I, uh, I agree. In the, in the long run, I think that that is the best attitude to have. I, w- I will say it kind of a very odd way. Because I was called a white supremacist by people at Yale, I kind of do on some level understand that I may know it's not true, but I could suffer repercussions because of someone else's ignorance. And so therefore, maybe I do need to challenge it I, or do something to change that. But again, yeah, at the end of the day, I, don't, I didn't get upset and like look to find the person and track them down and do all this stuff because... Uh, what am I going to do? Somebody says something like that, you can't change their mind. You just let it go. I've been called so much like, like that and worse over the years, especially the internet. You know, again, we're in the, that generation of people that 
were had the ability to say whatever they wanted to you in any way, shape, or form. But they also had this understanding that you got to give and take and don't be such a wimp. So we kind of devolved into an, a place where we don't. We, we learned, we trained ourselves to not take it personally. And these pansies haven't gone through that yet. So I guess it's time to go out there and crucify Pepe. You got to do what you got to do. And I guess, you know, if people are listening to this on the Internet Archive 70, 75 years from now, I guess the most important thing we can go out on you know, just for today's generation and all future generations, why would you say free speech and free expression are more important than any one person's feelings? Because free speech is the most important right we have. The only, the only reason we can articulate the other rights we have in life is because of free speech. Like, you and I can agree, hey, you can't do something that kills somebody. The, but the only way we can ever talk about that is because of free speech. So you have to have that one. Otherwise, nothing else matters. It doesn't matter if you have a fair trial or not. If you can't talk about it, you'll eventually never have it. Same with any other right. The right to vote. Voting doesn't matter if you can't talk about what's happened. Because if you can talk about what's happened... That means if somebody does screw with you in the voting, you can challenge it, and you can figure out a way to stop it. And so it's the it's the one ultimate protection in life. And that's why I said, you know, even if it does hurt you, if I do, you know, lose out on a scholarship one day or a publication or whatever it may be, so be it, man. It, that's kind of one of those same principle of I'd rather have uh, a thousand guilty go free than in prison one innocent. And the way I see it, you know, if someone in the past has already said it better than you ever could, just go with that. So I'm just going to read a quick quote from Texas versus Johnson. One of the most I was really hoping you were just going to be like, well, I can't say it any better than that, Mike, so we're done. Uh, yeah, that, that's great, too. That is, that's 1A <laughs> to my 1. Uh, going back to Texas versus Johnson, you know, the big flag-burning case from 1989. A quick quote from the opinion, if there is a bedrock principle underlying the First Amendment is that the government may not prohibit the expression of an idea simply because society, and society is a huge key word there, finds the idea itself offensive or disagreeable. And I think uh, a lot of people don't realize this, just how free of a country America is. I mean, you go to, obviously, we talked about this at the beginning of the program about what happened in Germany and the UK and even Canada. But, I mean, imagine living in some place like Saudi Arabia or living in, you know, Cambodia or any of the African countries or living in Venezuela where this idea that you can say whatever you want and you don't have to be afraid of the government coming and imprisoning you or killing you. Why would you give that away just because you have... A fragile ego. And I just wish people would look at that and kind of look at the bigger picture and just see how precious the gift of the First Amendment is and, you know, try not to give it away because of some, you know, identity politics nonsense. But, you know, we'll see it when we get there. Yeah, and uh, can just only, only hope we get there. It's all we can do. And I'll just let you have the final word, Mr. Coughlin. If you got anything to promote, some websites, anything you got coming up, you want to let our listeners and viewers know about uh just halfguarded.com 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 uh it's the same thing on twitter and facebook and all the other social media stuff but yeah um we're the little engine that could we just keep chugging along and we'll and undoubtedly publish something that within the next 50 years will probably be called hate speech once again we'd like to thank mike coughlin for taking time out of his busy schedule to sit down and chat with us if you're hankering for more of Coughlin's wit, warmth, and good humor, please do yourself a favor and check out halfguarded.com. Quite possibly the world's greatest MMA-themed pop culture site, and follow him on Twitter at, fittingly enough, halfguarded. Additionally, you can check out and download every episode of Not Economically Viable at the Half Guarded Podcast Archive for free at itunes.apple.com slash us slash podcast slash MMA hyphen stuff slash ID 111 
And of course, while you're there, you can check out all of Coughlin's podcasts too. Anywho, that's all we've got for you this week. Keep your chin up and your eyes on the prize, and we'll be back with more cultural erosion and social degeneracy in just a few. Thank you.